The cavity magnetron is a high-powered vacuum tube that generates microwaves using the interaction of a stream of electrons with a magnetic field, while moving past a series of open metal cavities. Bunches of electrons passing by the openings to the cavities excite radio wave oscillations in the cavity, much as a guitar's strings excite sound in its sound box. The frequency of the microwaves produced, the resonant frequency, is determined by the cavity's physical dimensions. Unlike other microwave tubes, such as the clostron and traveling wave tube, the magnetron cannot function as an amplifier, increasing the power of an applied microwave signal. It serves solely as an oscillator, generating a microwave signal from direct current power supplied to the tube. The first form of magnetron tube, the split anode magnetron, was invented by Albert Hull in 1920, but it wasn't capable of high frequencies and was little used. Similar devices were experimented with by many teams through the 1920s and 30s. On November 27, 1935, Hans-Erik Holman applied for a patent for the first multiple cavities magnetron, which he received on July 12, 1938, but the more stable clostron was preferred for most German radars during World War II. The cavity magnetron tube was later improved by John Randall and Harry Booth in 1940 at the University of Birmingham, England. The high power of pulses from their device made centimeter band radar practical for the Allies of World War II, with shorter wavelength radars allowing detection of smaller objects from smaller antennas. The compact cavity magnetron tube drastically reduced the size of radar sets so that they could be installed in anti-submarine aircraft and escort ships. In the post-war era the magnetron became less widely used in the radar role. This was because the magnetron's output changes from pulse to pulse, both in frequency and phase. This makes the signal unsuitable for pulse-to-pulse -pulse comparisons, which is widely used for detecting and removing clutter from the radar display. The magnetron remains in use in some radars, but has become much more common as a low-cost microwave source for microwave ovens. In this form, approximately 1 billion magnetrons are in use today. Construction in operation Hull or single anode magnetron in a conventional electron tube. Electrons are emitted from a negatively charged, heated component called the cathode and are attracted to a positively charged component called the anode. The components are normally arranged concentrically, placed within a tubular-shaped container from which all air has been evacuated, so that the electrons can move freely in an electron tube. The current of electrons emitted by the cathode can flow in only one direction, from the cathode to the anode. This property can be used to convert bidirectional current flow, alternating current, to one directional current flow, direct current, a process, known as rectification. A tube used for this purpose has only two electrodes, a negatively charged cathode, which emits electrons in a positively charged anode, which attracts the electrons that have been emitted by the cathode. Thus a current of electrons flows in one direction only, from the cathode to the anode. If a source of alternating current is connected between the anode and the cathode, current will only flow during the half of the alternating current cycle when the anode is positive in relation to the cathode. Thus the bidirectional alternating current is converted to a unidirectional direct current if a third electrode is inserted between the cathode and the anode. The flow of electrons between the cathode and anode can be regulated by varying the electric charge on this third electrode. This allows the resulting electron tube to function as an amplifier because small variations in the electric charge applied to the control grid will result in identical variations in the much larger current of electrons flowing between the cathode and anode. The idea of using a grid for control was patented by Leda Forrest resulting in considerable research into alternate tube designs that would avoid his patents. One concept used a magnetic field instead of an electrical charge to control current flow, leading to the development of the magnetron tube. 
In this design, the tube was made with two electrodes, typically with the cathode in the form of a metal rod in the center, and the anode as a cylinder around it. With no magnetic field present, the tube operates as a diode, with electrons flowing directly from the cathode to the anode. In the presence of the magnetic field, the electrons will experience a force at right angles to their direction of motion. According to the left-hand rule, in this case, the electrons follow a curved path between the cathode and anode. The curvature of the path can be controlled by varying either the magnetic field using an electromagnet, or by changing the electrical potential between the electrodes. At very high magnetic field settings the electrons are forced back onto the cathode, preventing current flow. At the opposite extreme, with no field, the electrons are free to flow straight from the cathode to the anode. There is a point between the two extremes, the critical value or Holt cutoff magnetic field, where the electrons just reach the anode. At fields around this point, the device operates similar to a triode. However, magnetic control, due to hysteresis and other effects, results in a slower and less faithful response to control current than electrostatic control using a control grid in a conventional triode. So magnetrons saw limited use in conventional electronic designs. It was noticed that when the magnetron was operating at the critical value, it would emit energy in the radio frequency spectrum. This occurs because a few of the electrons, instead of reaching the anode, continue to circle in the space between the cathode and the anode. Due to an effect now known as cyclotron radiation, these electrons radiate radio frequency energy. The effect is not very efficient. Eventually the electrons hit one of the electrodes. So the number in the circulating state at any given time is a small percentage of the overall current. It was also noticed that the frequency of the radiation depends on the size of the tube and even early examples were built that produced signals in the microwave region. Early, conventional tube systems were limited to the high-frequency bands, and although very high-frequency systems became widely available in the late 1930s, the ultra-high-frequency and microwave regions were well beyond the ability of conventional circuits. The magnetron was one of the few devices able to generate signals in the microwave band and it was the only one that was able to produce high power at centimeter wavelengths. Split anode magnetron The original magnetron was very difficult to keep operating at the critical value, and even then the number of electrons in the circling state at any time was fairly low. This meant that it produced very low power signals. Nevertheless, as one of the few devices known to create microwaves, interest in the device and potential improvements was widespread. The first major improvement was the split anode magnetron, also known as a negative resistance magnetron. As the name implies, this design used an anode that was split in two, creating two half cylinders. When both were charged to the same voltage the system worked like the original model, but by altering the voltage of the two plates, the electron's trajectory could be modified so that they would naturally travel towards the lower voltage side. The plates were connected to an oscillator that reversed the relative voltage of the two plates at a given frequency. At any given instant, the electron will naturally be pushed towards the lower voltage side of the tube. The electron will then oscillate back and forth as the voltage changes. At the same time, a strong magnetic field is applied, stronger than the critical value in the original design. This would normally cause the electron to circle back to the cathode, but due to the oscillating electrical field, the electron instead follows a looping path that continues towards the anodes. Since all of the electrons in the flow experience this looping motion, the amount of RF energy being radiated was greatly improved, and as the motion occurred at any field level beyond the critical value, it was no longer necessary to carefully tune the fields and voltages, and the overall stability of the device was greatly improved. As this normally causes more electrons to be released, it could sometimes lead to a runaway effect. 
Cavity magnetron The great advance in magnetron design was the cavity magnetron or electron resonance magnetron, which works on entirely different principles. In this design the oscillation is created by the physical shaping of the anode, rather than external circuits or fields. Mechanically, the cavity magnetron consists of a large cylinder of metal with a hole drilled through the center of circular face. A wire acting as the cathode is run down the center of this hole, and the metal block itself forms the anode. Around this hole, known as the interaction space, are a number of similar holes drilled parallel to the interaction space separated only a very short distance away. A small slot is cut between the interaction space and each of these additional holes, the a resonators. The resulting block looks something like the cylinder on a revolver, with a somewhat larger central hole. The parallel sides of the slots acted as a capacitor while the anode block itself provided an inductor analog. Thus, each cavity formed its own resonant circuit the frequency of which was defined by the energy of the electrons and the physical dimensions of the cavity. The magnetic field is set to a value well below the critical, so the electrons follow arcing paths towards the anode. When they strike the anode, they cause it to become negatively charged in that region. As this process is random, some areas will become more or less charged than the areas around them. The anode is constructed of a highly conductive material, almost always copper. So these differences in voltage cause currents to appear to even him out. Since the current has to flow around the outside of the cavity, this process takes time. During that time additional electrons will avoid the hotspots and be deposited further along the anode. As the additional current flowing around it arrives too, this causes an oscillating current to form as the current tries to equalize one spot, then another. The oscillating currents flowing around the cavities, and their effect on the electron flow within the tube causes large amounts of microwave radio frequency energy to be generated in the cavities. The cavities are open on one end, so the entire mechanism forms a single larger microwave oscillator. A tap, normally a wire formed into a loop, extracts microwave energy from one of the cavities. In some systems the tap wire is replaced by an open hole, which allows the microwaves to flow into a waveguide. As the oscillation takes some time to set up and is inherently random at the start, subsequent startups will have different output parameters. Phase is almost never preserved, which makes the magnetron difficult to use in phase array systems. Frequency also drifts pulse to pulse, a more difficult problem for a wider array of radar systems. Neither of these present a problem for continuous wave radars, nor for microwave ovens. Common features. All cavity magnetrons consist of a heated cathode placed at a high negative potential created by a high voltage direct current power supply. The cathode is placed in the center of an evacuated, lobed, circular chamber. A magnetic field parallel to the filament is imposed by a permanent magnet. The magnetic field causes the electrons, attracted to the positive outer part of the chamber, to spiral outward in a circular path. A consequence of the Lorentz force, spaced around the rim of the chamber are cylindrical cavities. Slots are cut along the length of the cavities that open open into the central, common cavity space. As electrons sweep past these slots, they induce a high-frequency radio field in each resonant cavity, which in turn causes the electrons to bunch into groups. A portion of the radio frequency energy is extracted by a short antenna that is connected to a waveguide. The waveguide directs the extracted RF energy to the load which may be a cooking chamber in a microwave oven or a high-gain antenna in the case of radar. The sizes of the cavities determine the resonant frequency, and thereby the frequency of the emitted microwaves. However, the frequency is not precisely controllable. The operating frequency varies with changes in load impedance, with changes in the supply current, and with the temperature of the tube. This is not a problem in uses such as heating.
or in some forms of radar where the receiver can be synchronized with an imprecise magnetron frequency, where precise frequencies are needed. Other devices, such as the clustron, are used. The magnetron is a self-oscillating device requiring no external elements other than a power supply. A well-defined threshold anode voltage must be applied before oscillation will build up. This voltage is a function of the dimensions of the resonant cavity and the applied magnetic field. In pulsed applications there is a delay of several cycles before the oscillator achieves full peak power, and the build-up of anode voltage must be coordinated with the build-up of oscillator output. Where there are an even number of cavities, two concentric rings can connect alternate cavity walls to prevent inefficient modes of oscillation. This is called by strapping because the two straps lock the phrase difference between adjacent cavities at pi radians. The modern magnetron is a fairly efficient device. In a microwave oven, for instance, a 1.1 kilowatt input will generally create about 700 watts of microwave power, an efficiency of around 65%. Large S-band magnetrons can produce up to 2.5 megawatts peak power with an average power of 3.75 kilowatts. Some large magnetrons are water-cooled. The magnetron remains in widespread use in roles which require high power, but where precise control over frequency and phase is unimportant. Applications Radar In a radar set, the magnetron's waveguide is connected to an antenna. The magnetron is operated with very short pulses of applied voltage, resulting in a short pulse of high-power microwave energy being radiated. As in all primary radar systems, the radiation reflected off a target is analyzed to produce a radar map on a screen. Several characteristics of the magnetron's output make radar use of the device somewhat problematic. The first of these factors is the magnetron's inherent instability in its transmitter frequency. This instability results not only in frequency shifts from one pulse to the next, but also a frequency shift within an individual transmitted pulse. The second factor is that the energy of the transmitted pulse is spread over a relatively wide frequency spectrum, which requires the receiver to have a correspondingly wide bandwidth. This wide bandwidth allows ambient electrical noise to be accepted into the receiver, thus obscuring somewhat the weak radar echoes, thereby reducing overall receiver signal-to-noise ratio and thus performance. The third factor, depending on application, is the radiation hazard caused by the use of high-power electromagnetic radiation. In some applications, for example a marine radar mounted on a recreational vessel, a radar with a magnetron output of 2 to 4 kilowatts is often found mounted very near an area occupied by crew or passengers. In practical use these factors have been overcome, or merely accepted, and there are today thousands of magnetron aviation and marine radar units in service. Recent advances in aviation weather avoidance radar and in marine radar have successfully replaced the magnetron with semiconductor microwave oscillators, which have a narrower output frequency range. These allow a narrower receiver bandwidth to be used, and the higher signal-to-noise ratio in turn allows a lower transmitter power, reducing exposure to EMR. Heating in microwave ovens, the waveguide leads to a radio frequency transparent port into the cooking chamber. As the fixed dimensions of the chamber and its physical closeness to the magnetron would normally create standing wave patterns in the chamber, a motorized fan-like stirrer is placed in the waveguide to randomize the pattern. This is not always effective for larger objects in the chamber, and most modern microwave ovens also include a rotating table for the food to sit on. The turntable, lighting in microwave excited lighting systems, such as a sulfur lamp, a magnetron provides the microwave field that is passed through a waveguide to the lighting cavity containing the light emitting substance. These lamps are much more complex than other methods of lighting, and not commonly used though efficient.